and welcome to The Greats on BBC Learning Zone. Tonight we're looking at great warriors. Of course, the thing about warriors is that we never actually hear how good they are until the battle begins. In the case of Genghis Khan, it seems, battle rarely stopped. His name has become a byword for uncompromising aggression. Though, strangely, it was also used for a while by a chain of restaurants. Rasputins and Hitlers, presumably, having been rejected as likely to put the customers off. By the early 13th century, the name Genghis Khan struck terror into the hearts of the enemy as he led his seemingly invincible Mongol armies into battle. 800 years ago, Europe awoke to a terrible army which suddenly appeared out of the eastern mists. Very little was known about it. What was known was terrifying. It had already annihilated everything and everyone who dared stand in its path. These were the Mongols, the Tatars, the Devil's Horsemen. Save us, O Lord, from the wrath of the Tatars. The call went out for the defense of Christendom. To Germany, ardent at war, to France, who nurses an undaunted soldiery, to Spain, to England, mighty with warriors and ships, to Sicily, to Ireland, to frozen Norway. But to no avail. Across Poland and Hungary, entire armies were put to the sword. It seemed nothing, not even prayer, could stop the invaders from sweeping right through Europe to the sea. The church, convinced that Armageddon was upon them all, preached that the invaders were none other than the children of Gog and Magog, the servants of Satan, sent to punish a sinful world. To others, it seemed that God himself had deserted them. This was the end of everything, of time itself. This scatter of stones on the steppes of Mongolia is all that is left of Karakorum. It was once the capital of the greatest land empire that there has ever been. For a few decades during the 13th century, this was the most important city in the world. Ambassadors and envoys were summoned here from as far afield as Kaifung, Baghdad, Moscow and Lyon to pay tribute to the great Khan. And it was from here that the Mongol rulers governed an empire that stretched for more than 5,000 miles from the Pacific to the Danube. Mongolia is today emerging from 70 years of isolation imposed by a communist regime which erased all reference to that early empire. The heroes of the past were dismissed as irrelevant and replaced by more contemporary idols. Men like Suke Bato, a contemporary of Lenin. But with Glasnost and all that has followed, Mongolians have begun to rediscover and celebrate the heroes of their distant past.
which have always tested both man and beast. Life is governed by the rhythm of the seasons. In the summer, when the temperature is over 100 degrees, the steppe nomads migrate with their flocks up into the cool highlands. Then in the winter, when it's 30 below zero for months at a time, they return to the sheltered valleys. The lakes and rivers remain frozen for up to six months a year. So generations of nomads have had to cut and cart great slabs of ice back to their camps for drinking water. The steppe nomads have always lived in tents, known as yurts or gurs. Made of felt stretched across a wooden frame, they can be dismantled and loaded onto ox carts in less than an hour. In this bleak environment, a life developed which is stripped of all but the bare necessities. The fuel? Dried animal dung, for there's no wood on the step. Eight hundred years ago, as today, the staple food was mutton. Almost every part of the sheep is eaten or used in one way or another. The Mongols made no pots, they never forged metal, they didn't even weave cloth. They never cultivated the land, nor kept pigs or chickens. They did nothing that might impede their ability to simply pack up and move on to new pastures. Life was a timeless battle with the environment and was mirrored in the struggles to defend good grazing land against their neighbors. Murder and tribal wars were commonplace. Yet, from these unpromising conditions, even harsher 800 years ago than today, there emerged the figure of Temujin, the man who would become Genghis Khan. From clues in the secret history, it is thought that Temujin was born in 1167 near Mount Burkhan Khaldun, in eastern Mongolia. His father, a local chieftain, was murdered by a rival tribe and Temujin and his family were abandoned. From the age of 13, he struggled to avenge his father's death and retake his birthright. The early part of his story tells of the making of important friendships and alliances. But after a series of betrayals, his private struggle turns into a campaign for absolute supremacy. For more than 15 years, Temujin and his followers waged war against one tribe after another. After each victory, supporters would flock to his cause only to melt away again at the next setback. Such fickleness persuaded him that he could rely on no one but himself and his immediate followers. Those that remained by his side were fiercely loyal, for it soon became obvious that Temujin was a brilliant military commander. It also became apparent that he was as much driven by personal revenge against those who had betrayed him as he was by a desire for conquest. In time, the victories became ever more frequent, until finally, in 1204, in a great battle against an alliance of all the remaining tribes, Temujin was completely victorious. later, Temujin was accepted as master over all the steppe nomads and invested with the title Genghis Khan. As he surveyed his army, he knew that victory was meaningless unless he could now impose some kind of nationhood on the disparate tribes. 
first, he had to destroy old loyalties and demand allegiance to him, and him alone. He did this by removing traditional commanders of tribal armies and replacing them with commanders of his own choice. In this way, he made himself the only possible focus of the new army's loyalty. For the first time in centuries, the nomadic tribes were united under a single standard, the Nine Tails. The new Mongol nation under Genghis Khan embraced all the eastern steppes. Its territory lay between two immensely wealthy civilizations, China to the south and east, and the Islamic empire of the Karazm Shah to the west. Though neither of these two empires posed an immediate threat, Genghis was never one to assume the best or to take things on trust. So he concentrated on developing the skills and discipline of his mounted soldiers, his cavalry. He began by taking the Mongols' favorite sport, the hunt, and turning it into a military exercise. Thousands of men were deployed in long, continuous lines that stretched for miles across the countryside. They would then sweep forward, driving before them all the animals in their path. Other units would be positioned at prearranged points around what would later become the killing ground. Each soldier was taught absolute obedience to learn his place in the line, to hold that place no matter what, and to think and act as part of a larger entity. Once the quarry had been flushed out, the riders surrounded it, preventing its escape. No one was ever allowed to kill until the Khan gave his command. Then it was an opportunity for soldiers to show off their individual skills. What emerged from these exercises was discipline and organization. Genghis structured his armies on a decimal system, decreasing from a two men, roughly 10,000 men, to units of a thousand, then a hundred, down to basic patrols of 10 men known as an Arban. Each unit commander, from patrol leader up to general, was chosen because he was the best man for the job. Most other armies of the time were commanded by hereditary nobles and princes. The size of their armies was an indication of their personal wealth, not their skills as commanders. Not so with the Mongols. Their leaders had all come up through the ranks. They were men who had proved their ability and loyalty in the field. <laughs> The entire army, tens of thousands of men, was closely organized and disciplined. Each soldier was required to keep four or five horses, a scimitar, shield, lance, two bows, and a quiver of 60 arrows. He had to be ready to move, maybe on a journey of hundreds of miles, in just a few minutes. In his saddlebags, he had to carry cooking pots, dried meat, a water bottle, files for sharpening arrows, and even a needle and thread. By 1207, this fully equipped and disciplined fighting force was ready. Genghis had long known that if he was to retain the army's loyalty at home, 
he would have to provide it with military success, raiding the civilized lands beyond the frontier. That meant China. For centuries before Genghis Khan, nomadic raiders had swept down from the steppes to attack the towns and cities on the plains of northern China. To keep the barbarians out, the Chinese had thrown up a series of walls. Eventually, these walls were linked together to form the Great Wall, but that wasn't until some centuries later. Despite their proximity, the two societies held each other in mutual contempt. To the Chinese, the nomads were the terrible uncooked, while to the Mongols, China was a soft and irresistible source of gold and silks, there to be plundered. China in the 13th century was divided into three separate kingdoms. The real heart of China lay in the south. It had been ruled for hundreds of years by a dynasty known as the Sung. To the north lay the Jin Empire, governed by a Manchurian dynasty. To the west was Shi Xia, easily the weakest of the three, yet it had never been conquered. This is where Genghis made his first raid into foreign territory in 1207. It was also the Mongols' first encounter with a civilization which built cities, static defenses and huge monuments. Although the kingdom was not conquered, after two years of raids, Genghis had extorted a vast amount of loot from this rich and opulent domain. Genghis also extracted a promise from the king that he would provide troops to assist the Mongols in future campaigns whenever the need arose. Satisfied, Genghis withdrew from Shishia and decided to turn his attention further east, towards the Qin. The Jin were far more experienced at dealing with invaders. The northern highlands had always been their first line of defense. The Jin kept close guard on the passes. But the Mongols had planned carefully, and by 1211, after several sharp engagements, they overran the mountain garrisons. After that, they hoped the way was open onto the fertile plains beyond. But the Jin were not about to succumb that easily. Right across their empire, the alarm drums were sounded. This was the traditional way of inspiring almost hypnotizing the Jin defenders. By the summer, the Mongols finally confronted the Jin army. Though heavily outnumbered, Genghis decided to attack. In a devastating display of mobility and discipline, Genghis's mounted archers poured a shower of arrows onto the Jin ranks. Totally demoralized, the Jin army then faced a shattering charge of the Mongol heavy cavalry. Within a few hours, the 70,000 strong defensive army was utterly destroyed. When the terrible news reached the capital, the Jin commanders retreated behind their fortified walls. Here, they reckoned they were safe, for they knew the Mongols did not have the equipment or the training to breach these defenses. Genghis had to admit that they were right for the time being, but he vowed to return. If the Jin walls and cities were strange, incomprehensible to Mongol eyes, so too was the fertile countryside peopled by millions of peasants they wondered at the well-ordered terracing, at the irrigation canals, at the farms and villages. What the Mongols didn't understand, they despised, and what they despised, they destroyed. Over the next few years, hundreds of thousands of Chinese peasants were slaughtered.
By the time Genghis's armies returned to attack the capital in 1214, they were equipped with rudimentary siege machines. The Mongols isolated the city for almost a year, condemning the citizens to appalling privations. In 1215, the capital finally surrendered, and the Mongols entered unopposed. Once inside the walls, the alien sights and sounds of the city perplexed and aggravated the Mongols. For once, discipline broke down. The soldiers ran amok. They rode up and down the narrow streets, setting everything ablaze. Tens of thousands were slaughtered in a frenzy of uncontrolled butchery. A visiting ambassador reported that when the fires were put out, the city was littered with corpses and the streets greasy with human fat. Genghis Khan was not there to see the slaughter. He was already preoccupied by events far off to the west. In 1218, a caravan of Mongol merchants traveling to the great western empire of the Karazm Shah were stopped and then executed as spies. Genghis sent an envoy to demand an explanation. When the envoy was also executed, Genghis Khan was furious. Revenge was inevitable. The Karazm Shah's empire was fabulously wealthy, especially the cities, for they lay along the Great Silk Road from China to the Middle East. The greatest of these cities was the capital, Samarkand, which the Karazm Shah had turned into an opulent pleasure palace. Here lived Chinese and Persian artisans who wove silk, worked leather, produced silver lame, wove carpets, and even forged an early type of steel. It was a lively cosmopolitan society. Karazm Shah himself was a vain creature, fated by his courtiers as the second Alexander the Great. He believed their flattery and was confident he could handle this arrogant barbarian called Genghis Khan. Genghis took his time. Indeed, he took a year to prepare for the campaign. He withdrew his army from China, summoned men from every corner of the steppe, and put together the greatest concentration of Mongol power ever seen. Estimates put the Mongol army at more than 100,000, but it was probably still less than half the size of the Karazm Shah's forces. Before setting out, Genghis sent word to the king of Shishya, calling in his promise to provide troops whenever they were needed. But the king replied that if Genghis didn't have enough men, then he didn't deserve to be the great Khan. As Genghis turned his army west, he resolved one day to avenge this insult. The Mongols faced a march of more than 1,500 miles towards their objective, the cities of Bukhara and Samarkand. Their spies had told them that the Karazm Shah had deployed his defences along the Sir Darya River, the empire's frontier. Genghis divided his army into four separate divisions, three of which attacked the frontier at several points at once. The fourth and largest contingent, led by Genghis himself, secretly crossed the Sir Darya River further north and then promptly disappeared. Instead of turning south towards the enemy lines, Genghis led his army due west, straight into the Kizil Kum Desert. The Kizil Kum was impenetrable. There were no known water holes, no roads, no landmarks. But Genghis had a guide who did know a route through the wasteland. For months, his contingent made its way secretly across the sands. 
Then, in March 1218, as the defending armies used up their strength against the other Mongol attacks, Genghis suddenly emerged. Over 400 miles behind their lines, outside the walls of Bukhara. Military historians still point to it as one of the most dramatic outflanking movements in the history of warfare. Panic swept through the city, and shortly afterwards, the Bukhara garrison abandoned their posts. Once inside, Genghis and his men galloped into what they imagined was a palace. When it was explained that he was inside a mosque, he ordered that it be converted into stables. Copies of the Quran were thrown to the four winds, and the boxes that had held them were used as mangers. Then Genghis mounted the pulpit and berated the citizens about the treachery of their sultan and the reasons for his victory. I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed great sins, he would not have sent a punishment like me. Terrified by the accounts of massacres in China, the Bukharans awaited their fate. Unlike China, the sacking of Bukhara was disciplined and controlled. Beneath this very minaret, thousands of people were put to death as a deliberate warning to others that there was no alternative to immediate submission. The city was stripped of its treasures and a tribute extracted from the wealthy families. Then most of the women and children were herded off to Mongolia. city walls were then systematically destroyed and refugees were dispatched to spread the news that Bukhara had fallen. A large contingent of the male population was then herded out in front of his army and with this human shield Genghis marched on Samarkand. From behind these very walls, the citizens of Samarkand watched for the dust cloud of the approaching Mongols. The Khwarazm Shah had already abandoned them. He had fled westward a few days earlier. The Mongols put to the torch that part of the city which lay outside the walls, and Samarkand surrendered within five days. Within just a few months, the Mongols had smashed one of the largest empires in the world. But there was still a personal score to settle. To seek out the Khwarazm Shah, one of Genghis Khan's finest generals, Subadai, was dispatched to the west. Genghis himself turned south toward Afghanistan in pursuit of the Sultan's son and the remnants of the empire's army. To the Mongols, this was a strange and alien land. They knew of it only from stories told by nomadic wanderers like these. and that was thousands of miles away in China. From Samarkand all the way to the Indus River, almost everything they came across was a revelation. To a people who traveled only with what they could carry on their horses and who lived in felt tents, it was bewildering. 
Genghis Khan determined that in future his people would live their lives as richly endowed as these people. Glassware, silks, pottery, carpets, tapestries, gold, silverware. These were the trappings of cities that had for centuries set their inhabitants apart from the nomads. These things would now adorn the inside of Mongol tents. They were loaded up and taken back across the steppes in massive caravans. More importantly, the Mongols also sent back to their homeland all of the artisan families who produced these works. From the great city of Gulganj, chroniclers claimed, 100,000 artisans were deported. The story was repeated everywhere. It was one of the greatest enforced migrations in history. The tools, raw materials, and all the skills of the great cities were transplanted to the empty grasslands of Central Asia. This was more than just plunder. Genghis was setting down the foundations of an empire. The most highly prized of the city dwellers were the metal workers and engineers. These were the people who would build and update the Mongol war machinery. They would forge scimitars, design and manufacture catapults and ballistas and all the other siege machines the Mongols would deploy in future campaigns. But Genghis Khan had not 